Good evening, everybody. Welcome back uh, to Keene State College's Career Development uh, Seminar. Uh, this is a class of mine. My name's Tom Cook. Keene State College is a part uh, member of the University System of New Hampshire. If you're not familiar with where Keene is, we're in the southwest corner of New Hampshire. And you'll probably be hearing a lot about us uh, over the next couple of weeks since uh, a certain election is coming up soon. And New Hampshire likes to consider itself uh, an important part. We're, you know, I think we are. Um, but this class, career development, is for mostly juniors and seniors who are looking to graduate. I think all of the, the students here are hoping to graduate at some point in time. And the question becomes, what are they going to do when they get out? Uh, obviously, trying to find work is one thing. So we'll focus on uh, job placement, uh, writing resumes and cover letters and, and doing interviews, things like that. But just finding work, there are other options that are available. You might uh, become an independent video producer uh, doing wedding videos or client videos. You might go into graduate school. So we'll be taking a look, uh, not necessarily here, but in class we do that. Uh, one of the uh, more popular aspects of the course, I think, for the students in particular and for me, is to uh, invite guests. We usually have a guest every week who will uh, Zoom in, uh, given the uh, pandemic situation right now. Uh, we have uh, folks Zooming in and interviewing and talking with the class. These folks are either graduates of ours who have gone on either to work in film or not work in film and discuss their experiences, both when they were here uh, at the college in the film program and what life has been like for them post-graduation. We'll also have uh, uh, career professionals, uh, folks who are work in the film and television industry, uh, as many of our grads do, um, but we've had uh, a lot of well-known folks. This will continue throughout the uh, semester here uh, through most of November and briefly into December, so we we'll hope you'll join us every week. Uh, this week, we have a graduate of ours, Trisha Danauer, uh, who has uh, been uh, out and about quite a bit. She's got quite a, a history, if that's a word, background uh, for us. And um, I'll uh, introduce Tricia, thank her for being with us. And you can tell us uh, what all you've been doing in the uh, years that you uh, graduated from the program, which wasn't even actually an official film program at the time, wasn't it? Weren't you in theater, dance and film? It was film studies. I don't think it was an official program yet. Right. Works. Here. Well, thanks for joining us. Tell us about yourself. So, well, thank you all for having me here. I'm very excited to share um, my life experience with everyone. So I have had a very interesting life since graduating. And I think with, uh, with the combination of life events, real world events and personal events happening, my life has gone in an unexpected direction. Um, so I am currently not working in film, but I am currently and have been teaching at the college level since 2014. But before that, I began teaching uh, internationally in Kenya as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and before that, I was working in television at WMUR uh, Channel 9 at Manchester, New Hampshire. So I went backwards and chronologically wise, but um, but you know, life has a funny way of working uh, for you. And if I could, I would like to share my screen because I did prepare a photo collage of how my life has evolved. So I think I just click the share screen and I can do that. I believe so. Okay, so let me see. Yes. Okay. There we so, go. There we go. So, and I think my theme uh, for tonight is you want to try to live a creative life, be it with obviously your major as film, being filmmakers, but even if you don't end up doing something directly with film, you can find something creative in your life outside of that in any direction you take. So I would like to name this series or tonight's topic, Living the Creative Life. So um, for me, I think there are the first aspect of living creatively is having the spark. You have to have the, the drive, the ambition to live beyond what is 
expected for you and you and a curiosity brings you to find or to get to get you in the path that you are curious about and for me that started actually before I entered uh, Keene State College in 1994, 1995. So I'm really dating myself there. And once I graduated from high school, I decided to take a year in between high school and Keene State. And I was an exchange student in Germany. And these three pictures here pretty much sums up my experience living abroad for the very first time. And the picture on the right is actually at the end of my year there. And I had to give a speech at the graduation in German. I was terrified, but I did it. (laughs) And I practiced for weeks on how to enunciate all the German words correctly. And, but that was such a... Um, confidence builder for me being able to not only just give a speech but to do it in a different language was extremely daunting for me and it doesn't matter that leading up to that I had four years of German in high school and a year of speaking German throughout that but speaking publicly in another language was a huge terrifying event but I did it and also just being in a different culture and, and having my family and um, the people who are in the picture on the, on the bottom right-hand corner, they helped me create such a profound experience. And for me, that was such a huge eye-opening that there is more beyond what you currently live in. So there's more to explore, more to discover, and more to figure out what you're interested in. So after that, I did come to Keene State, and this is a um, uh, like a TBT of my time and the film program. And I think the the big picture on the left. I think Tom. I think this is right. We were. I was the first person to be a script supervisor. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so um, that was such a, a fun experience for me. And just learning that aspect of, of, of filmmaking and just paying attention to detail and looking at the finite things of things, um, anything that you can contribute to a bigger whole is a great feeling to be a part of. And um, the picture on the top right, I got to participate or be a boom operator for, um, Tom, I can't remember, this is um, Matt Newton's Getting Out of Abigail, yep. and it was a, a panoramic something. I can't remember. It was a special. It wasn't like the final project, but it wasn't was. The, getting Out of Abigail was the um, advanced project. Yeah. Then we had the, the Panavision project uh, oh, okay. uh, another time. Okay. You were And you were involved with that. Yes, I was. But this, but this one I was involved with, and I got to be the boom operator for that. And it was, it was, it was, um, it was, we did it over the summer and, um, and you can see the car is so dated, but it was such a great experience. And then the picture on the bottom, I was, that again was um, for the Justin's uh, final the senior project. And that's where I, again, was the script supervisor. So this was my experience um, at the Keene State College uh, film program. So after I graduated, I decided to actually stay in New Hampshire. And I decided to work at WMUR. And I thought that I like news. I like um, current events. I'm very interested in that. I have a wide range of interests. And so working at the news station, I think, opened my eyes that there are other directions that you can do with telling a story. Because for me, um, creating a film is essentially another way of telling a story. And with news, I, I liked the aspect where I could do camera, I could do graphics, I could do the videos, I could do audio, I could do everything. And so I liked all aspects of that. And plus you get to um, you know, meet important people because New Hampshire does have the New Hampshire primaries. So that was when George Bush came and we got to meet him and they did a debate in the studios. So then, um, life has a funny turn. 
And I had worked at WMUR for about four years and I had decided that I wanted to make a big. I wanted to branch out and do more with television. And so I opted to go to New York City. And I did that in June of 2000, um, 2001. So I was there for 9-11. And um, so when I moved to New York City, I was on a high of life. I'm like, I'm going to make it big because I did have a contact with ABC New York and ABC Washington where I could start freelancing for them. And that was my hope was that I wanted to branch out from local television news to get to the national level. And I was this close to actually making that happen, but 9-11 decided to make everybody change their priorities. And I guess a one positive of being in New York City, I did get to meet Philip Seymour Hoffman, rest in peace, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, but, you know, I was having great friends. My, I went to a wedding with my sister, who's that's in the top right hand corner. But 9-11 just changed everything for me. And, um, and New York City was no longer a fun place to be in. It was just very depressing. And um, I still remember 9-11 like it was just yesterday. Um, and it just, it really set me in a different path. So what I ended up doing was I moved to Georgia where my sister was living at the time. And I decided to join, after two years, I decided to join the Peace Corps. And if you can see here, this, the slogan that Peace Corps uses, the toughest job you will ever love, it's truly that 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 is 100% accurate. But my second part or my second point of being living a creative life is be accepting of the unplanned. Um, you know, nobody wanted 9-11 to happen. None of that was in my uh, trajectory of what I wanted my career to be. So you have to be accepting that even if something unfortunate happens there don't don't look at it as if it's being completely negative try to think within yourself okay I'm given this situation what can I do with what I have available and for me I wanted to really figure out who I was so I went to Kenya for two years and I began teaching um, and training uh, teachers about HIV AIDS prevention and I think the, the landscape of Kenya is um, remarkably beautiful, but it's also very sad. And so there's a lot of um, diversity with that. And I think for having been there for two years, I really had to struggle with what pictures I could show you because there's so much more to this experience. But um, for me, the highlight was training the teachers meeting the students, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with my students. And, um, and I did leave with the, with I hope it is still there, um, an HIV AIDS resource center that was at one of the secondary schools where I taught. I wrote a grant for that and, and we got them computers, we got them books uh, to educate them about HIV AIDS prevention. So that was um, a very alarming, life-changing experience for me being in the Peace Corps. And then I come back to New Hampshire and you would think that I would kind of figure out, okay, what am I gonna do now? But unfortunately I was, I think even more lost in some, in some cases because I did have, unfortunately, I experienced a, a traumatic event at the, the one week before I was supposed to leave Kenya, I was involved in a carjacking and um, that completely set me back. So when I came back here to New Hampshire, I was, I think, even more confused and trying to deal with that trauma in having to um, find myself again, but I did. And I decided I'm going to try to, continue with my, my journey of teaching. And, and in 2009, 2010, I went to Korea. 
And uh, Korea, if you know, um, in order to be an English teacher in Korea, you just have to be a native English speaker and have a degree. And so my, my, my um, introduction into fully becoming a, an accredited teacher, I did it backwards. I gained experience in Kenya. And then I, then I decided I already have the, the English skills and I do have a degree. So here I am in uh, Kenya, I'm sorry, Korea. And I just, it was such a huge risk again, going this time so much farther away from my home, so much more out of my comfort zone. I mean, look at the signs there. Everything is in Hangul and learning Hangul took some time. But eventually I immersed myself into the culture and you can see I attended a, um, a Noribang, which is a singing room. So just living it up. And, um, and I even took a risk and started salsa dancing. And, and so I think just trying to find um, an outlet to express myself in a variety of ways really made my experience in every location very memorable. And I was in uh, Korea for about four, four years. And I think I probably would still be there to this day, but, um, but life events do happen and my mother uh, passed away. And so I decided to return back to New Hampshire to be with my family. Um, but I think if that hadn't happened, I probably would still be there because I just loved uh, Korea so much. And again, you can see there's just, I love the Noribang and I do have to, um, ironically enough, I went across the other side of the world and the picture on the bottom right hand corner is another King State College um, uh, graduate. I think she was an education major, but how ironic is that? I went all the way to another country, like 10,000 miles away. And there I meet another King State College graduate. Um, so it was just a wonderful experience. And I think out of living in Germany, living in Kenya and living in Korea, I was able to be vulnerable, be open to the experience and not being afraid to take a risk. So my, my message to you as future graduates is, you know, it's always good to have a plan A, but also have a plan B because you never know. And, and, it's, and it's trial by error. Basically, I wanted to be in film. I wanted to do in that route. But, I, and, and, but I, in the end, I think I found something that is more suited to my, my personality and what I can do as, a, as an English instructor now. Um, and I think even being a teacher, and you can find ways to be creative. So no matter what direction you take, um, or if you go in a different path, you can find ways to be creative in a variety of fields. So I would like to end when there's some more pictures. <laughs> so this picture is very funny. Um, my uh, kindergarten students, they're very glam. And I just had to, um, I don't know why I put in the picture, but that is the border of South Korea and North Korea. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, most people wonder about that, but, um, but I did go there and um, not much happened, but it's a lot of pomp and circumstance, but um, just don't go over that line. So, um, but I would like to uh, leave you with two quotes that I think could be applicable to uh, you as your job search continues is this. Um, this is from one of my favorite uh, authors, Elizabeth Gilbert. Maybe you've heard of her from Big Magic. And she says, a creative life is an amplified life. It is a bigger life, a happier life, an expanded life, and a hell of a lot more interesting <laughs> life. Living in this manner, continually and stubbornly bringing forth the jewels that are hidden within you, a fine art in and of itself. And another quote that I do have is maybe you also heard of Brené Brown. Uh, she's famous for the TED Talk and she's also um, a professor and an author. And her quote is, vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. 
So I think as you approach your careers, be innovative, be creative, and be willing to have unexpected changes in any point of your life and as you begin your career. So that is me. <laughs> so thank you. Applause, Ben. <laughs> what, what motivated, did you have a choice to go to Kenya or someplace else or to go to uh, Korea or someplace else? Um, I, I'm trying to, should I stop to share? I'm not sure. Um, I actually, it, well, if I go back actually to um, my, my hair, um, being accepting of the unplanned, I had no control over things that happened in Kenya. I only had control of the geographical location I could potentially go. So, so when I'm, you joined the Peace Corps, they said, do you want to go here, 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 or here? You had to uh, select three areas, um, you know, number one, number two, number three, but right. weren't guaranteed that you would get your number one choice. Okay. I fortunately, I put Africa as number one. And I was kind of hoping to go to Western Africa because I wanted to learn French, <laughs> but they ended up putting me in Kenya. And I'm like, you know what, that that's, I can't, I don't have any control over that. I can't be mad with that. And I was okay with it in the end because I did learn Swahili and really? I, yeah. Oh, I learned enough to get me by. Okay. Um, but, um, but I don't, I, you know, I was happy with it. Um, and I liked, I liked the area that I was in. Yeah. And what about, uh, what uh, took you to Korea? Um, primarily because I knew that I wanted to get back into teaching after having taught in Kenya. And the one way that I could do that was because I didn't have the credentials yet. I didn't have the education yet. So one way to do that was just to gain the experience. And then while I was there, I did earn, I began my first graduate program for education and literacy and then when I finished that I immediately started a second master's program in English and creative writing. Um, so I think the main objective for going to Korea was to get that teaching experience and then worry about adding the credentials later. Right. Mm -hmm. You graduated well before um, uh, we brought on our uh, uh, Joan An. Have you mm -hmm. met Joan or do no. you know of her? No, because she's from uh, she's from South Korea. We should okay. introduce, get the two of you together. Yeah, that would be great. So great. can you? So you said that you can speak Swahili at least passing. Yeah. Can you speak Korean? Annyeonghaseyo. That's hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Um. Uh. What else can I say? Okay. Oh, I'm now I'm thinking Swahili. So. <laughs> how did you? How did you? Mm -hmm. start getting by because when you showed us that picture uh from korea that yeah. was my exact thing it's like you know i just have to point at something and say give me one of those <laughs> how, how do you start i learned actually hangul which is the korean alphabet it's not that it's not that difficult to learn it's the sounds that are hard to remember because the sounds are nothing like anything related to English and, and because I know German and at that time I knew Swahili. So I was referring back to other languages that I know. Um, but with, um, but with Korean, even though the, the, the letters are easy to read and I could sound it out, but remembering the sounds is very hard. Okay. So, and when I would see something and I would read it out, I'd be like, oh, that's the English word, but just with Korean letters. So they have a lot of that. <laughs> so at any point mm -hmm. when you lived there, did you find yourself dreaming in Korean? Because that's for me when, when you immerse yourself in a language, it took two or three years of French study for me to start dreaming in French. Um. I can't remember if I've ever dreamt in Korean, but I do dream in German. Okay. Um, and I probably only just German because I really right. studied German the longest because I did four years in high school. I spent a year there. And then when I started at Keene State, I did two years of German um, as a freshman and sophomore. So I spent more time uh, actually learning German. 
And so when you, I'm, I'm monopolizing and I'll turn it over to the students okay. in a second, but when you gave your, um, your talk yeah. in German, was it, you talked about it being as, as nerve wracking as it was, was it just public speaking or that? That was probably my first speech I've ever given ever in my entire life. Okay. Um, except, you know, not, you know, not counting, you know, in high school or, or middle school when you have to give a, right. a presentation, nothing like that. And, and I just remember um, when I went, when I, leading up to me giving that speech, I was so nervous. My knees were shaking. I was sweating. I just wanted it to be over. <laughs> and this actually, the audience actually calmed me down because when I went to go move the microphone closer to my, to my mouth, my hand was shaking so bad. The whole audience laughed. And because they laughed, that calmed me down. And I was able to do the speech after just releasing that nervous sure. uh, tension <laughs> of it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It said that uh, the number one fear people have is of public speaking more than death. Jerry Seinfeld always said that. So that being the case, people mm -hmm. would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> folks, um, so uh, Trish has had quite a worldly experience. And you can see that. And I, and I, uh, I really appreciate and respect that you emphasize the creativity yeah. aspect of it, because that's certainly what we as filmmakers all do, but we all have the artistic spark within us. Right. And Trish has found that way to pass that on. And in mm -hmm. particular, not to push it, but um, as a teacher, to be mm -hmm. able to pass that on. Mm -hmm. um, class, do you folks have questions for, uh, for Trisha about her pathway or anything like that? I have a question actually, um, yeah, in regarding um, your WMUR um, position when you first came out of college and um, what you're thinking of before 9-11 and stuff. Um, so I have like multiple times thought of um, doing broadcast news as yeah. like um, potentially like a plan B or something if like I don't end up doing film. And um, I've thought about uh, MUR or even um, just because I love Boston, uh, mm -hmm. like um, Five or BZ or whatever. And I'm just curious. Um, I know in the picture, um, one of the main pictures you have, you're working the camera. Right. But what was your main role there? Were you doing camera or were you doing like a bunch of other stuff like um, editing and were you doing the prompting and stuff like that? I did everything. So I started at WMUR. I was really lucky. I feel very fortunate that I was able to interview with them. I believe this after graduating in 98, <laughs> I, I started working at WMUR part-time. So I really had to prove myself uh, to the production manager and um, so every few days I would go in and I worked the evening. I did from three to 11. And they slowly, they started me first with a teleprompter, which is the, um, uh, what they read off of in front of the camera. And then I slowly learned to do camera. And then, and then I learned, then I became full-time, um, I think by the fall of, um, of 98. And, um, and then I started learning to do tapes, um, which was the most stressful thing to do. So, but overall, I, it was, you know, baby steps. You learn how to do a little bit of everything. And eventually I did get promoted to be studio coordinator. And that's where I was in charge of setting up the studio. Um, whenever guests would come in, I would mic them up and um, call them onto the sets and things like that. So I was in charge of making sure everybody needed to be where they had to be when we were doing live news. So, and then I left as a studio coordinator because I did try to go to uh, ABC, New, ABC New York in Washington. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's um. Sorry, I'm. <laughs> no, go ahead. I, I apologize for like um kind of um I guess getting excited more so about that yeah. because my high school that I went to um the video production program that we had there, uh, my professor he actually worked 
or my teacher rather, he worked as a um, in a news studio somewhere to you in, um, I think it was like in Rochester or Albany, New York. Mm-hmm. So a lot of stuff that we ended up doing was um, kind of like mock stuff that they would have done at MUR. So that was kind of like a very interesting and it was, I'm glad that I was able to talk to you and find out more information about that. Yeah, I, I just remember um, I was very persistent um, in getting this position. I remember, I think it was my second interview ever. And I remember going into the production manager's office and I was literally clueless. Maybe this class would have helped me um, then, but um, I just remember sitting there and just nodding and being very attentive. And, and then after the interview, I probably every other day would call uh, the production manager saying, have you made a decision yet? Have you made a decision yet? Because I really wanted this position because there really weren't any other opportunities. And I knew that I wanted to stay in the New Hampshire area. I wasn't interested so much to go to um, California or New York because um, I wanted to be local. So yeah, <laughs> it's an odd choice, I know, but, but my family was here, so hmm Yeah. Good. Mm-hmm. Folks, other folks, or Colleen, keep at it. Up to you folks. <laughs> I have a question, actually. Yep. Um, do you Anna? ever your, oh sorry. <laughs> do you ever mm-hmm. see yourself um teaching film specifically? Um I actually actually through um because uh, a few years ago, I created a curriculum for American Dream, and it ended up being using a lot of uh, books and, and films, uh, films. So I did a combination of books and film with that. But in terms of um, film production, um, I don't know if I, I don't, I would not say I'm qualified enough because I went in a different direction. I think I could apply criticism like Larry, Larry, Tom, but, but I think that would be the extent of that. So I could talk about movies all day, <laughs> but, but production, maybe not so much. So. Well, so what got you when you went to MUR, mm-hmm. were you just looking for, kind of like an all around television education because you know the shot with you operating the camera right. is that something you were dying to do or is that something you did just to hone up on your skills maybe to hone up on my skills because okay. i i knew that i could do a little bit of everything um there were graphics there were sound there was uh you know the tape machines and um and even directing, like I, I would sometimes, I remember I was, when we would do, we would uh, pre-tape the teases, which is what you, sh- what you see at 10 and 10 minutes before 11. So we pre-tape those. And I would sometimes follow the director because they could call it out and you just have to, you know, punch a lot of buttons. Um, so there's a, there's a lot that you can learn in news production that is similar to film production. It's just a lot more, um, maybe fast paced because you're doing it live. Well, and that's certainly my experience with television in general Mm -hmm. was film major, like motion pictures. You've got this huge set and cast and, uh, and crew and everything. And it, it's very slow. Yeah. The kind of the, the the span of it is exciting, but mm-hmm. I fell in love with the pace of television. I I would say yes. I like I I remember liking the adrenaline of being behind the camera when the news was going on. Um, but when I did have a few opportunities to freelance for ABC Washington. Um, especially around the New Hampshire primaries, a lot of the the national organizations will come into New Hampshire. And if you look at the bottom right hand corner, you can see CNN. So a lot of these big wigs from the the big networks will come in. And um, I was able to be selected along with two other people to go work for Nightline. And um, 
And it was a long day. There was a lot of sitting around (laughs) and um, it was just, we were waiting, waiting and waiting. And the actual shoot itself would be very short. Um, So if you have a book to read or something like that, bring that or your cell phone. Um, So, but that was a little, um, an eye opener for me. Even when I did something for Nightline in New York City, it was like a 15, 17 hour day, not much happening with the actual recording. It was just a lot of sitting around and, and waiting. Maybe that was because of the role that I was given. Um, but you know, maybe if you have a higher, um, a higher up role, you're more engaged with what's going on, but I was a freelancer. And so I was just waiting a lot. And that was kind of not really interesting to me. I wanted to be doing more than just that. Sure. So that's something to consider. If you go to the bigger networks, it's, um, it's tough to break into for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else folks? Yeah. (laughs) Actually, I have another question that I'm curious about. Where are you currently teaching? I'm teaching right now for the community college system of New Hampshire and for Southern New Hampshire University. So I teach at two locations. Mm -hmm. Now, is that all remote? Um, One class is a hybrid and all the others are remote. Okay. Yeah, because of COVID, so. All right. (laughs) Yes. Mm -hmm. Folks, jump in. See where everybody else is. I have a question, uh, just really quickly. about your experience with the Peace Corps and getting involved with that and how you decided that you wanted to um, work as a teacher. I know they have a couple of different opportunities that's not just teaching. Um, right. If you could talk a little bit about that. Um, well, my brother actually, he was the one who inspired me to, um, to apply to Peace Corps. Um, and so that was kind of anomaly in itself, but um, but there are a lot of sectors within Peace Corps that you can um, apply for. Uh, in Kenya specifically, I remember them, they're having um, health education, which is the program that I was in. There was public health, there was business, um, environmental sector, and there was even death education. So so every country, depending upon the needs of that country, will have different sectors. So not all uh, countries will have the same. It's basically what that country needs. And they try to fill in, um, they try to match you with your experience and how you can apply that to a need that that country has. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's it's not so much about where, because the last time I kind of looked at their website and their opportunities, mm-hmm. it seems like it was kind of like a job application and you could kind of choose what you're meant for. But um, um, I, if I can think um, my, my application, um, I don't think I really even had a control over the the sector that they were putting me in. They were matching me with with the 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 experience that I had, my previous volunteer experience because when I did move to Georgia, I started volunteering with the Red Cross, so I was building my 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 Peace Corps application for that. And, um, but I don't even remember if I selected a sector because I didn't know which country I was going to. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a, it's, it's a, for, for when you apply, it's really a shot in the dark of where you're going to go and what you're going to be doing. So, yeah. (laughs) And it's a long process. I think I told Tom over the summer, I think that this, this process for applying was more intensive and more complicated than any college application I've ever done because it was intense. I have heard a lot about that. That's yeah. <laughs> or are they trying to filter out the bad apples or make sure that you have the skills they need? What, what, what made it so uh, uh, demanding? I heard it's competitive. 
Okay. And, um, and they really want to make sure that you are going to be committed for the two years. Okay, right. They don't want to spend $10,000 or whatever it takes to get you there, only for you to say after six months or a year, oh, I'm done. You know, they really want people who are going to be committed for the full two years. And, um, and I, and I knew from the very beginning that going into this program or being a volunteer in itself, it was completely out of my comfort zone entirely because gone were the comforts of electricity, toilet, taking a shower. So for me, I was so determined to be comfortable with being uncomfortable for two years. And so I wanted to accomplish this for me and, you know, it just built you up as a person. How did the locals there treat you? Were they accepting? Do they speak English? What? Um, Kenny is actually uh, formally colonized by England. Okay. So English is one of their official languages, but in the pictures you see here, this was my village. Uh, they don't speak English. And that's why on this particular day, I had a student because uh, I wanted to take pictures and I needed somebody to ask permission beforehand. Right. Um, I think being a, a white person in an African country, um, you're going to get stared at. You're going to get people coming up to you trying to touch your arm, touch your hair because you're not, they've never seen a white person before. Um, so it's kind of like you're a celebrity all the time and you have to be on all the time. Um, because, um, you know, how you dress, they're going to talk about that. I had to wear a skirt for two years because I couldn't wear pants so much. Um, and, um, very conservative and just, um, but they were, they were excited, but also very, um, there was some trepidation as well, especially with young kids. Cause they would follow me. I would have a trail <clears throat> of kids follow me down the road on that particular road. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I could talk about Peace Corps forever. So <laughs> yeah. Do you ever, mm -hmm. do you stay in touch with anybody back there? Um, or is there a means of communication? There's, really? no, there's no means. No, really? No. Um, what, I know were your, what were your objectives there then when you were there? My objectives as a Peace Corps volunteer was to train the teachers at my schools about HIV AIDS prevention. Okay. So the health, the Ministry of Health and Education, they wanted to integrate knowledge about HIV into the classroom because there's a lot, there's a huge stigma, especially at that time about HIV AIDS, um, just anything about HIV. Mm -hmm. So for example, I would give a training course to a biology teacher about the, the, um, the immune system and how HIV affects the immune system. You could have a class about writing in English about the history of HIV. You could have a history class about how HIV has evolved. And um, so all of the classes, all of the subjects, I trained the teachers how to integrate true factual information, trying to destigmatize HIV so they could feel comfortable talking about it and teaching their own students. And these are local teachers or yes. other Peace Corps volunteers? Um, other, so the teachers, so the man that you see there that I'm giving a certificate to, mm -hmm. he was actually my counterpart at the school. And so he was my partner in, um, in working with the other teachers, but he also went through the, the training program that I led and he passed or he finished the training and therefore he got a certificate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And I also taught, uh, I went to uh, primary schools and secondary schools, which is equivalent to high school. And I did community health classes as well about HIV with the, um, with the students. Mm -hmm. So, Were you there on, did you go with anybody from America or was it just you plopped right down in the middle of Kenya? Uh, 
Well, so Peace Corps is very good about how to get you from A to B, because if I think if I had gone by myself, I wouldn't have gotten on the plane. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they, they integrate you into the program in stages. So um, we, I was told to, to arrive to Washington, D.C., where I was there for about a week because you have to go through like the final health check and you have to start getting your shots and it's, and then you meet the people that you are going to be in a group with. There was about a hundred people. Um, and we all were in Washington DC for about three or four days. And then we all fly together. And then, and so the, the transition from the United States to Kenya, you, you go in stages. So it's not like, okay, here you go, get on the plane and now you're there. No, that's not how it happens. It's, it, they, it's, I think it's smart how they do it. Cause otherwise I think people would be too terrified to go. <laughs> so, yeah. It would have to be a huge culture shock if you were just boom, all of a sudden there. It, it would be. And I think probably the first night, I, it took me a while to fall asleep because I'm like, okay, I'm here in Kenya now. Uh, <laughs> things are going to be different. Um, but I also, for me, I had that experience of having lived in Germany. So it wasn't my first time abroad. So I had my experience, have already lived in Germany to, to rely on. So I knew that some days would be good, some days would be bad. And, um, and um, you kind of just roll with it. And, and when I moved to Kenya, I'm sorry, when I moved to Korea, I did just that. I went on the plane by myself and, and I was okay with it because I had already gone to other two places. Sure. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. I've been monopolizing it. Other questions, folks? <laughs> I have another question. Yep. Um, did uh, your teaching in Korea help for you to be able to be, to be teaching at like a community college now, or did you have to do like another like course to be able to be, um, that's a good question. Um, when I was in Korea, I primarily taught kindergarten, as you can see, uh, kindergarten and, and I also did elementary. Um, I, I would say yes and no. I would say no in terms of teaching, um, Americans and, because there's a whole different audience. I think Tom would understand that or would know what, what's involved in that. But, yeah. um, but, but teaching English and teaching the language and, and conversing about grammar and literature and all of that, I just built and built and built, you know, with every class, every subject, every course I taught, the more experience you have, the more confidence you get in relaying that information to students. So I would say it helped in terms of the subject, but the audience that you're teaching, I had to learn by trial and error when I came back to the United States because I went immediately from elementary and kindergarten right to college level. I did not go to the middle at all. So it was a huge jump for me, yeah. I'll unquestionably second that the best way to learn a subject is to teach it. Yes. <laughs> and to be um, comfortable. Yeah. Uh, I learned early on. And again, Tricia was one of my earliest students here full time in, in at Kane State to learn early on not to be afraid to say, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Let yeah. me get back to you because that's the way you're going to learn as an instructor. Mm hmm. One piece of information that I, I can't remember who told this to me, but another uh, colleague or, or I can't remember where, but this person told me that you, in order to really understand the class or the subject, maybe more just the class or the course that you're teaching, you have to teach it seven times. <laughs> and, and I think maybe even more than that. Um, but until you have taught it multiple times, then you're really going to understand 
how you can how you can actually teach this information in a positive and um, effective way. Tom, do you agree to that? <laughs> Overall, uh, I think you certainly have to teach it multiple times. What I've found, yeah. and God, this is my 25th year, mm -hmm. um, I'll find that I'll be presenting something and I'll turn around and, and this was back when we were in actually had classes. I'll turn around and say, didn't I just go over this recently? <laughs> oh no, that was last year. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get lost, but um, no, it, it, you're right that, uh, mm -hmm. and the students and, and questions you folks all have uh, are what bring out in many respects, the best in your teachers, mm -hmm. because we find out either what we're not getting across to you or what you're interested in and mm -hmm. forces us to go more in depth. Mm -hmm. And that's where I wanna just stress the, the idea of living creatively because no matter what you do, especially in the teaching aspect, you can't just have a, a one size fits all. You have to be reflective of your craft because teaching is a craft. I, I'm, I'm, I'm positive of that. That's how I feel. So you have to constantly reassess how can I improve myself? How can I make this beneficial for my students? So you constantly have to uh, work with um, the feedback that you get and then build from that. So it's a constant uh, reflection at the end of the semester. Uh, what can I do? What can I do better? Um, this didn't work. So maybe I need to try this. And uh, for anybody who says, oh, I'm a teacher the same, no matter what, then, um, then I don't think that's a very good teacher or not a creative. <laughs> teacher. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you find what did you comment on either both the Kenyan? I'm seeing more certainly social aspects of your being involved in Korea than necessarily. Maybe it's just the pictures that you chose in right. the Ken Kenyan environment. Um, what were the societies like? What was the like, uh, you know, right now there's such social unrest here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like women have fought for equal rights and still haven't gotten them after X number of years. Right. Can you comment on the, the difference in the societies? Um, Kenya, Kenya, let me just go look at Kenya. Um, Kenya was very conservative, very, um, very primitive, um, very single-minded, um, very isolating in ideas. Uh, there is a lot of stigma about things and, um, and I think one downside of, of, uh, Peace Corps being involved in Kenya because Kenya from, from the very inception of the Peace Corps model, Kenya was, um, right there from the very beginning. So Kenyans were used to uh, saying, hey, there's a, a rich person from America, uh, maybe they can give me money. Uh, so there's a misconception about, um, about Americans and what they can bring to the, their community. Okay. Uh, Kent, Korea, on, both have case. Korea, on the other <laughs> hand, I, I think out of the three, out of the three, Germany, Kenya, and Korea, I think Korea was my favorite because the it was safe. Um, yes, they were conservative in nature, but they really have a fighting spirit to be the best. They have a huge emphasis on education. Teachers are highly respected there. Um, they just love learning and um, they just work hard at everything. And um, I feel sad that children in, in Korea don't really have a childhood because they're always in school. They do school like from seven to five at night. They go to a, they go to a tutoring and then they even have school on the weekends. They don't wow. have a childhood. Um, but, but I liked the fighting spirit of, of Korea. I liked the, the party aspect of it because I loved going to the Noribang like four o'clock in the morning. I think I, I never partied as hard, you know, until I went to, to, to Korea. Um, but I just, I think um, the, um, the people are generally very courteous and it's safe. And I just, I absolutely loved it. 
Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Other questions, folks? Jump in. <laughs> uh, what made you decide to go to Keene State and study uh, study film? Um, you know, that is um, that was so long ago. Um, honestly, when I when I uh, applied to Keene State, um, I didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do. And, um, and I think that's probably one reason why I opted to do the, the year in between high school and college, because I just wasn't really sure. And, um, and I had an opportunity to go to Germany because my high school in Manchester has a sister, um, sister city relationship. So I decided to do that. But, um, um, and I think, um, but, but when I initially applied and my remember my freshman year at Kane, I decided to do journalism, which is a segue off of, um, you know, film, if you want to call it that. But I do remember um, why I transferred into film. And that was because of Jumanji. <laughs> it was huge. People were talking about it. I mean, I went down to the to the circle, saw the film production, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is what I want to do." And uh, and I think that was I can't I, my sophomore year. I think going into that, and I asked my parents to switch my major, and and I enrolled into the the film program. So very spontaneous. It was very unplanned, but I went with what inspired me and I don't regret that at all. Anything that I have, that I, any decision that I have made, I do not regret because I'm happy with where I am now. Excellent. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Else folks, Dylan, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, If you were to be in the industry, Mm-hmm. What would you, what job would you like to do? Hmm. Um, I don't know. Um, probably writing because I do spend a lot of time now writing. So I would, I would, um, I would, I would do screenwriting. Yeah. Cause I, I love writing. So I think, um, I've always written throughout my whole life. I don't know. I didn't really focus on it at, at Keene, but, um, but that is something that I've done on my own pretty much my whole life. Some aspect of writing. Any myself. thoughts about writing down your story? Ready? I'm actually working, um, on a memoir okay. <laughs> of, of, of this experience and, um, and, I have a different uh, perspective or a different direction I would want to take it. But I think um, um, I think I would want to write about my experience having lived in these three different places and how women are portrayed as um, I'm definitely going against society's expectations for women. So I think um, I'm not living the, the standard life that you expect of women. And um, so my memoir is a little bit of exploring um, my different path. Well, that was kind of what I was wondering, my allusion to, um, mm-hmm. and I was, I was kind of fudging around it, mm-hmm. uh, talking about the social aspects of yeah. Kenya and, and uh, Korea right. is how they treat women. You said that they respect teachers. Mm-hmm. Did you feel that you were properly respected as a, as a teacher and a person and a woman? I think, well, funny, so so here's an interesting story. Um, my very first week, my very first full day in Korea, um, the school that I was first stationed at, and you can see it there, a little campus. It's on the top right-hand corner. Um, there at that particular school, there were t- me and another teacher. And at that time, um, in Korea, I was 35, 36. So, you know, mid, mid thirties. And, um, and the, the other teacher, he was from England and, and he, he introduced himself to me 
and I told him uh, how old I was. And he, the first thing he said was, shouldn't you be home making babies? (laughs) And, And I was like, how dare you? And I mean, and we had a frosty relationship ever since then. So this was a British person saying this to me. Right. And but but the Kenyan, I'm I'm sorry, the Koreans were very polite. And I think because, um, yes, they they kind of treat foreigners a little bit differently, but they're very they they interact with you based on their age. So anybody who is older than you or has a high position, even their language is constructed that way. How you give, how you shake your hand or, or how you bow is all indicative of your, 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 your age status. So they, want, they will ask you right away how old you are because they want to know how they can articulate hello to you because the endings have different uh, meanings. So age is very important to them. It's not supposed to be an insult if they ask you how old you are. But um, in terms of with women, I think as a foreigner, I would have been and have been treated differently. I don't really know so much how how, um, Korean men necessarily teach or um, interact with uh, women, but I do know that uh, divorce is looked down upon and family is everything. So you want to bring honor to your family. So if you get divorced, it might have an implication of it could disrupt your community, how you are seen in your community. If you get divorced. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I will never forget that British person who said that to me. Cause <laughs> I was like, how dare you? So, you don't exchange Christmas cards or anything. No, no. Okay. Fair enough. Not even Facebook friends. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Other for questions, folks. We're running, not running out of time, but well, it's it's been an hour. Other questions? Any f- questions finalizing here with Trisha? It goes by fast. Yes. Yeah. Anybody? <laughs> well, Trisha, I can't thank you enough for uh, uh, chiming in and zooming in with us. Um, I think it's always interesting to find out, you know, we've had a lot of people who have, uh, well, uh, who have worked in the industry. I think it's interesting to see that that's one of the things for Keene State is it's a liberal arts college. And you can see where, because you've been so well trained in a wide variety of areas, we can see where you were able to bring that education and, and benefit not just yourself, but I mean, look at the communities that you've helped benefit throughout the world. I think it's really uh, something to be proud of. Well, thank you. Uh, we respect that. Um, if there are any other questions, any closing comments, Tricia? Um, no, I just want to remember, I just want to reiterate that, um, you know, if plan A doesn't happen, there's always plan B and don't ever doubt yourself because you are creative people. I enjoyed listening to you in the earlier, in the previous hour. So just remember to, you know, think, you know, live every aspect of your life creatively, uh, be accepting of what comes and always take a risk because you never know what will happen. That's a great, uh, it's only taken me 50 years to learn that. Um, it's a great comment. And, and, a lot of the our guests have said pretty much the exact same thing yeah. that uh, you got to go out and uh, take life by the horns. Otherwise, nobody's going to hand it to you. That's a great yeah. bit. So yeah. thanks very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thank everybody for uh, chiming in and watching us and listening to us. I thank Mark Gumpler and um, uh, Misty Kennedy for being our producers behind the scenes. Next week, we will have another grad um, who has been uh, out and about for quite a while. And actually, Sabelle Mandel is um, producing her own feature film, uh, many of whom, many of our, uh, uh, the students who are in the class right now are uh, working on that. So we'll have an opportunity to see, because she's been out and not involved a lot in film and kind of got the itch back and has started that back up. So it'll be interesting to see what Sabelle's been doing. So we thank you all for uh, watching us. This will continue for the next uh, six or eight weeks, we'll have a lot of different guests from a lot of different areas. And uh, we will hope to see you all next week. Have a good week.